very good afternoon to all of you. It is really my pleasure to uh, come and share the Lord's Word as well as to worship with you. This is my second time here and I always remember because uh, uh, I do have to take off my shoes and uh, come into and uh, stand on holy grounds. And uh, before that, uh, may I bring you greetings uh, from the Baptist Theological Seminary. I also bring you greetings from Reverend Peter Lin, our president. Allow me to thank uh, Brother Roy for inviting me to share God's word. And uh, when I came, it was good to see very familiar faces. The first time when I came, I remember, you know, I walked in and uh, I recognized uh, very, very few people. And I remember I saw uh, Pastor Joshua Shu. I saw his wife, and then I remember Roy, and of course, Pei. And that was about all that I could recognize of ex Baptist Church. But today, praise God, there are a lot more that I can recognize, okay? So we are thankful to the Lord for the body of Christ. And this afternoon, I bring you, uh, you know, the Word of God on title, Moving Forward, Looking Beyond the Present. Yeah. Moving Forward, Looking Beyond the Present. Now, you have heard this phrase again and again, and I'm sure that uh, you are a little bit tired of it, but you will continue to hear it for a while. And that is, we live in uncertain times. We live in uncertain times. We live in challenging times. Uh, sometimes you don't like to hear these phrases because it's a little bit despondent uh, in terms of you know, these phrases, right? But it is here to stay. And definitely as Christians, we recognize that our spirituality is always anchored upon life's reality. So there's no running away from it. So how do we as Christians face up to today's times? How do we live? How do we see things? How do we move forward? And this is something we want to consider from the Word of God this afternoon. So before uh, we continue to look into the Word of God, uh, let us just go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, we want to thank you that wherever your people gather, there, Lord, you are in the midst of us. And Lord, as our praises rise to you, Father, we pray that you will accept these praises for you alone are worthy. And Father, we want to thank you. We thank you for the body of Christ of we, each one of us is a member of when we become your children. So bless, dear Lord, as we open your word and let us behold your truth that is able to help us understand your heart and see the way you see life and the way you see times. So Father, we pray that you grant us years that are inclined to you and hearts, Lord, that are humble to receive from you. May your spirit continue to just work among us. We give you praise and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, despite your challenges, despite your challenges, one of the things that I've come to recognize is that as sincere believers in the Lord, we always want to serve him and we want to serve him well. But sometimes when things are difficult and things are challenging, you know, despite of our best efforts, we cannot help but feel disheartened. You want to be faithful, but you cannot help sometimes but feel discouraged. You know, there was a story that I remember uh, about Satan sending out all his little messengers and they are supposed to go out, you know, and bring about some measure of havoc, you know, to believers. And one by one, when the uh, Satan's messengers came back, they told him, we tried all sorts of ways, but we couldn't move them. And then Satan says, I have one last tool. And they say, what is it? And that is the tool, he said, discouragement. The tool of discouragement, he said, without fail, it never fails in that sense. And I remember as a young Christian, when the Lord first called me to ministry, I hesitated. I hesitated because I was fearful of one thing. I was fearful of the fact that I will be discouraged. It's very, very vivid in my mind. I'm a person easily discouraged. I'm a person who was rather timid. And I felt that if the Lord called me to ministry, and should I be discouraged, I will dishonor him. And so I didn't want to go into the ministry. But when my pastor asked me, I told him very uh, honestly that this was one of my greatest fear about giving my life to the Lord. And he said something not too profound, very simple. 
but truth is still truth, and truth liberates when it's spoken at the right time. And he said this to me, he said, he said, we will all face challenging times, we will all have difficulties. And he said, but it is during those times that we need to trust the Lord. Just simple, just a simple statement like that, nothing profound. But that reminded me, that reminded me that it is those times that I need to trust the Lord. You see, I had looked at it and just looked at it as my effort. But I had failed to look at something else, and that was just simply to trust God. You know, our text takes us to the time when Israel was facing challenges and discouragement in their desire to be faithful during uncertain future, during an uncertain future. If you look into the history of Israel, if you look into the history of Israel, we know that Babylon destroyed Jerusalem in 586 BC, and then Israel went into exile. But in 539 BC, Babylon was defeated by Persia. And when Babylon was defeated by Persia, there was a very famous king called King Cyrus. And God used King Cyrus with the addict for the Jews to return to their homeland. And of course, uh, they returned. There were three returns. There were three returns. And the first wave of return was 50,000 people under Zerubbabel in 536 BC. The second return was 5,000 under Ezra in 458 BC. And the third return was 42,000 under the, the leadership of Nehemiah. Our context is the second return of, under the second return of Ezra. You see, when the people came back from exile, you can just imagine, right? In terms of the historical setting, 70 years in captivity, 70 years, and now they come back. When they came back, what did they return to? Was it beautiful buildings? You know, every time you come back to Singapore, a new tree sprung up, new buildings sprung up. But for them, no, it was all a rubble. It was a devastation of the nation. And what did they do? The first thing they did was to build an altar. They built an altar on the grounds of the ruined temple. So that was how they started. But when they had finished building the altar and they were supposed to continue to build the temple, there were oppositions. It wasn't that smooth, right? There were oppositions from the Samaritans. And how many years was the work laid off? For those of you who know Israel's history, any guess? The work was laid off for 16 years. 16 years. And that was the context of Ezra 5, in which we want to look at. Ezra 4, 23 to 24 reads this. It says, Thus the work on the house of God in Jerusalem came to a standstill under the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. 16 years for a moment. That cause, once again, is lost and forgotten. But God's purpose is never thwarted. God's work is not without trials. We all know that. God's work is not without troubles. God's work is not without testings. But God will never allow his purpose to be thwarted. So how did God encourage his people? So the first thing was God sent. God sent his word through his prophets. God sent his word through his prophets. In Ezra 5, 1 to 2, he reads this. Now Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the prophet, a descendant of Edo, prophesied to the Jews in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel, who was over them. Then Zerubbabel, son of Sheatil, and Joshua, son of Josedek, set to work to rebuild the house of God in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God were with them, supporting them. I don't know about you, but when we read, you know, when the people returned to their homeland, they were actually excited. You know, after 70 years without a nation, without your geographical land, you are excited if you're going to have your own land, right? Your own place and to rebuild the temple. They were excited about that commission. 
but repeated opposition and defeat, discouragement and acceptance of the status quo crept in. It is one thing to come back to ruins, to devastation from exile. Yes, maybe they might have questioned and said, you know, where are the, what, where, where's the promise in sight? They might have questioned that. Where's the resemblance, you know, to the previous glorious promise or the temple that they had or they heard about from their parents? But they had the promise of God. They had the promise of God, otherwise they would not return. They had the promise of God that they would be a nation, a nation that will restore them as a people. They foresee that they once again may be a people and a nation that God favors, a strong people with prosperous land. But opposition from all sides? They do want to restore the temple and rebuild Jerusalem but they repeatedly faced obstacles, ridicule, and the last of it was a decree from the king. When the king decrees that you should stop, what can you do, right? Dreams fell apart. Excitement gave way to apathy. What is the point? Not that we don't want to rebuild, but we can't. So they gave up and they focused on other things. You know, my brothers and sisters, I don't know about you. I see that many of you also have been serving the Lord for a long time. Have you gone through phases like that? You know, where you felt that I want to build up the work of the Lord where he has placed us together. But obstacles after obstacles seems to come in. Not that I don't want to be faithful, but I can't. And I don't see anything that seems to be an open road for us, an open way. And when apathy comes because you think that you can't do anything, then you will turn your attention to do some other things. And that was, that was what Israelites did, that, you know, Israel at that time did. So rather than, you know, rebuilding the temple of God, they went to rebuild their house. And we saw that, you know, this is true when we look at the messages of Haggai and Zechariah, because they were the two prophets that God sent, right? And what was the message that God gave to them? The first thing when you look at Haggai, the message given was put God first. Put God first. Continue rebuilding the temple. Put God first. And then when you look at Zechariah, Right, that was what the Lord says, rebuild, rebuild my temple so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored. What was the message of Zechariah? Zechariah's message was rebuild the temple. Why? Because you need to prepare for the Messiah's coming. Zechariah 2.12 reads, prepare, the Messiah is coming. The Lord will inherit Judah as his portion in the Holy Land and we'll again choose Jerusalem. You know, oftentimes when we look at ourselves, you know, and we say that we can't because the obstacles are too many. I can't do it. You know, when we use this phrase, I can't do it, then the problem is where it is because it is not about I. It is always about God. It is not what I can do for God. It is not about that effort. It is not about that usefulness as much as it is about obedience and faithfulness. That is the difference. That is the difference. So how can this kind of dismal situation be reversed? And that's why the Lord sent the two prophets. And when the Lord sent his word through his messengers, the people began to pick up the initiative. How long did they take to finish rebuilding? They stopped for 16 years, right? How long did the whole process of rebuilding took place? Four years. Just in four years, they completed the building. But just in case, you know, sometimes when we look at the rebuilding of God's temple in Israel at that time and focus only on the temple, we might have missed the point. 
because the rebuilding of Jerusalem was not about the rebuilding of a nation or just a nation. The rebuilding of the temple was not just about rebuilding a temple where they can worship God, but ultimately the rebuilding of Jerusalem was about a covenant people of God. Let me say that again. The rebuilding of Jerusalem was about a covenant people of God. What about the temple? The temple was the very thing that would give God's people their identity. Their identity which is tied to the worship of God. To give up that rebuilding of both Jerusalem and the temple means that they would give up their identity and their essence of who they are. It is giving up their faith. It is giving up their calling as God's people. Today, no matter how difficult it is, Christians still gather to worship God. Why? Because that's their identity. You still worship God because that's the essence of who you are as God's followers. And so it was the same. The rebuilding of Jerusalem and the temple basically reflected the essence of God's people. They are God's covenant people. And the temple was to show them that their worship is tied. The temple is tied to their worship of God himself. So to give up, is like giving up their faith, giving up their identity, giving up who they are. You know, when COVID first hit about two over years ago, one of the group of people that worked very, very hard, and we all know, right, are the health frontline workers. And we all saw that during that COVID season, they plot on and on and on. They were exhausted, they were tired, they were discouraged because no matter what they do, the virus kept mutating, you know, people come in, there were a lot of infections, numbers went up, it didn't come down. But did they give up? They did not give up. They cried, they were exhausted, they were discouraged, but they did not give up because they cannot give up. They cannot give up because the health of the nation depended on them. The health of the people depended on, on them. The lives of the people, when we say about health, we mean lives. The lives of the people depended on them. To give up is to surrender the fight to live. So they would not give up. Today, we applaud them. We appreciate them. Because when the times call for it, they stepped up to it. My brothers and sisters, when we do not see the eternal purpose of God, it is hard to carry on. When we fail to recognize who we are as a people of God, there is no conviction of being a set-apart people. And so to help them finish the task, God sent the prophets to remind them of why they should complete their mission. You see, it's hard to continue when you don't have conviction. It's hard to persevere when you don't have that belief. And so that's why Haggai and, Zerub and Zechariah had to remind them of who they are and continue to put God first, that their rebuilding has a greater significance to come. The rebuilding of the church of God or the building of God's church has great significance in terms of the church and its mission. We have heard this said before, the church is the hope of the world and the hope of the church is the leadership. It's the leadership. Is there conviction that you hold regarding who the church of God is and what the church is called to do? What is your legitimacy as a church of God? You are called ex-Baptist church. What is your legitimacy as a church? What is that conviction that would drive your perseverance and refusal to give up on the mission of God that is entrusted to you as a church? I was reading, in preparing the sermon, I was reading and going through some of the plans that ex-Baptist church have. And I look at your three-year plan, you have this statement. 
to be a loving, united community devoted to prayer with spirit-filled power for God's disciple-making purpose. That was part of your three-year desire that God laid upon your heart. If you do not believe that God can make you into a loving, which is already a fact by the blood of Christ, united community that is devoted to prayer, and you are devoted to prayer because you believe that when you pray, God will fill you with His Spirit and therefore empower you to fulfill the great commission of making disciples. I also read your strategic priorities. You want to have a group of leaders, of 12 godly leaders, and I'm really very encouraged by what you have done. You've taken steps you know, to send your leadership to be fostered into a team through MAP, and I can see that the leaders really mean to build themselves up so that God will use them for his purposes. And I pray that, you know, whatever sometimes a church plays on the paper, it will not just be writings, not on paper. It should be written upon our hearts. And that's what conviction is all about. And at every juncture of history, every juncture of history, and for us at this crucial time, it is crucial and important that God's people remain faithful. You see, the faithfulness of the returnees from those who returned from exile was crucial in the plan of redemption that God has for the world, right? That's why Zechariah says, you know, you need to build the temple. You need to rebuild the temple. Why? Because the Messiah is coming. You need to prepare for the coming of the Messiah. And that Messiah is our Lord Jesus Christ who will come and die on the cross for the redemption of the whole world. So the faithfulness of the returnees were crucial in terms of God's plans. Their obedience has broad and wide significance as well as eternal consequence. My brothers and sisters, just like Israel then, today, we live in critical times. Some people say it's unprecedented times. And I would like to use a word to say that we live in pivotal times. We live in pivotal times. Pivotal in the sense that our faithfulness and our obedience will determine the future spiritual landscape of the nations and people. Do we see how important it is in terms of our faithfulness and our obedience to what God lay upon our hearts? Just like the returnees, if they are faithful, it determines for us today that redemption that is at work. If today we are faithful, it will determine the future landscape of the people who will be blessed by the ministry that God is going to do through you. But are you disheartened? But are you discouraged? In your heart, is there somewhat of a mental agreement, but in terms of Inside, you have kind of given up. God gave his word. God gave his word and God will give preachers and teachers and more so God gave his son and his written word, the Bible, to reveal to us his plans for the church. Secondly, God will always watch over his leaders God will always watch over his leaders. Ezra 5, 3 to 5, read this. At that time, Katanai, governor of Trans-Euphrates, and Shetha Bozenai and their associates went to them and asked, who authorized you to rebuild this temple and to finish it? They also asked, what are the names of those who are constructing this building? But the eye of their God was watching over the elders of the Jews and they were not stopped until a report could go to Darius and his written reply be received. My dear brothers and sisters, we do not fight a battle against flesh and blood. It is always the spiritual forces. And what is Satan's battleground? Satan's battleground is always the minds and the hearts of men. He will go for the mind and the hearts of men. That's why here in verse 3 to 5, we read, 
uses intimidation. The enemy uses in intimidation. Who authorized you to rebuild this temple and restore this structure? Who? That's a measure of the intimidation. And secondly, they will use threats. What are the names of the men constructing this building? What are the names? Give me the names. When you have names, then you're in serious trouble, right? And sometimes when we want to make an official complaint, we will ask, by the way, what is your name? Right? You know, that's the kind of intimidation and threat. And that, these are the things, you know, when you, you are intimidated and when you are threatened, you will become fearful. And when you are fearful, you will stop doing what you think, even if it's the right thing to do. But Scripture tells us, but the eye of their God was watching over the elders of the Jews, and they were not stopped until a report goes to Darius. The confidence of the leaders is in God. The confidence of the leaders is in God, not in circumstances. You know, courage often requires that trust. How do you have courage in the face of intimidation and threat? You know, just have an example of the early church. You know, in the book of Acts, we read that, you know, when the early church went preaching, Peter, John, Paul, they always have oppositions. But what is it that enabled them to persevere and to keep doing it? It is because their fear of God is greater than their fear of men. They seek to please God above pleasing men. You know, when you care more about obeying God than your welfare, there is a peace of God that overcomes because you know that your God is more powerful, your God is greater, and He watches over you. You know, there is a pluck that I have when I was a young Christian, and this pluck would say something like, there is nothing, I cannot remember the exact words, but it's something like that. It says that there is nothing that will happen to you that had not gotten God's permission. So, so my thought has always been, if anything that is really to happen to me, I had gotten God's permission, then it should be well. If God is watching, then God is in control. He will take care of what will happen if we take care to do what he has entrusted. I like this phrase very much. Duty belongs to us. Events belongs to God. Duty belongs to us. Events belong to God. Let me give you some biblical example of this. You know, when, when Moses was born during that, during that Exodus period, you know, a lot of babies were told by the Pharaoh, right, to be killed by the midwives. But the Hebrew midwives, you know, there were some of them who were very godly. They did not kill the Hebrew babies because they fear God. Of course, they gave the excuse that ba the Hebrew babies are too energetic. They came out before we could kill them, you know. But they feared God, so they did not kill some of the Hebrew babies. What about Moses' mother? Moses' mother kept him until she could no longer keep him and then put him in a basket down the river now. Does she know what will happen? No. She only did what she believed was the right thing to do until she could not do it anymore. And the result was a great leader in Moses and the great deliverance from Egypt with a spectacular display of all God's power in the ten plagues, the parting of the Red Sea and the journey to the Promised Land. You see, my brothers and sisters, we are people who desire to have control. We want to know outcomes. We want to know, if I do this, what is going to happen? But life is not always like that, isn't it? There are certain things we know we can do, but what will the outcome be? We do not know. 
One of my favorite psalms is Psalm 131. Psalm 131 reads like this. It says, My heart is not proud, Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. But I have calmed and quieted myself. I am like a weaned child with his mother. Like a weaned child, I am content. Israel, put your hope in the Lord both now and forever. Just three verses. But this psalm always reminds me, you know, that as a weaned child, sometimes we may not even feel that God is present, but God will always be present. If you are parents, you understand that perfectly well. God will take care of the outcome. We just need to do our small part. We don't need to be in control. We don't need to know everything. We just need to know this. Stay the course and stay true to God and stay true to his purpose. That's all we need to know. Leave it to the Lord. Beauty belongs to us. Events belong to God. And thirdly, God thwarts evil to work for his purpose. Chapter 5, verses 6 to 17, but we'll just read some of the verses. In verse 9, we question the elders and ask them, who authorized you to rebuild this temple and to finish it? We also asked them their names so that we could write down the names of their leaders for your information. This was to King Darius. This is the answer they gave us. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Babylon, King Cyrus issued a decree to rebuild this house of God. Now, if it pleases the king, let a search be made in the royal archives of Babylon to see if King Cyrus did in fact issue a decree to rebuild this house of God in Jerusalem. Then let the king send us his decision in this matter. A letter was sent to King Darius. When a letter is sent to the king, what will happen? The last time a letter was sent to the king, and that was after Xerxes, the work stopped for 16 years. Is the work of God once again going to be stalled? Is the work of God once again to, going to be futile? Is obedience going to amount to nothing? The work has just gotten started. Will it stop again? You know, when you think you've just gotten on a good start and troubles come, they never come on their own. Troubles always bring their accomplices. And sometimes before you can even recover from them, the next one is at your heels. You know, no one, none of us, I think, are going to be knocked down by just one problem. But often it is the many problems, and not just many problems. It is many problems that comes one after another, that before you could have your next breath, they come again. It is troubles like this that wears you down and discourage you. You know, as one who serves the Lord, I have my fair share of discouragements. And I remember sometimes, you know, when I don't see results, I don't see outcome. So I'm just you know, very, not very different from you, right? When I don't see results, I don't see outcome. I do get discouraged. And I wonder whether you know, the years spent in building something is futile. And I remembered, you know, I said, Lord, can't you just encourage me a little bit? Let me see some fruits. You know, let me have some positive outcome. I would pray that way. But God will always send his word, right? And one of those days, you know, when I was praying like that, you know, praying to see fruits, praying to see outcome, not because I don't believe in God, I just needed some encouragement. But the Lord did not answer me that way. The Lord sent me his word. And he gave me Isaiah 49, verses 3 to 4. And this verse reads, He said to me, You are my servant Israel. Of course, the context is a little different, but the word was timely for me in whom I will display my splendor. But I said, I have labored to no purpose. I have spent my strength in vain and for nothing. And that was like exactly speaking my heart. Yet what is due me is the Lord's hand, and my reward is with my God. 
And when I read that, I was greatly comforted. My reward is with my God. What is due me is in the Lord's hand. So timing is everything, right? It may not happen now, it may happen after. I may not see it now, but it may be part of a bigger picture. And it reminds us of Hebrews 11. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And so we say, yeah, you know, so maybe it's a matter of waiting. But the question is, is it just a matter of waiting? When is waiting a sign of faith? You know, waiting can be also a sign of indifference, right? Ah, let it be, you know. I said I wait, but actually inside, it actually means I don't expect too much. So when is waiting a sign of faith and when is waiting a sign of indifference? When is it God glorifying and when is it God dishonoring? It is God glorifying when it is a matter of obedience. If God has given us something to do and trusted a mission to us or when God has called us, and when we obey, that is God glorifying. Obedience is a response. Obedience is a response. Do what the Lord has revealed to you to do. You know, I share with my students, don't talk about usefulness. We like to talk about usefulness. I want to be useful to the Lord. I say nothing wrong. I pray the prayer myself. I sing the song myself. Use me today, Lord. That's my prayer. But prior to use me today must be a heart of obedience. Because God wants us to obey him. If you obey him, you will always be useful. You know, there's a story about a grandma, you know, that promised a grandson a special stamp book for Christmas. And when asked, he would always include this as one of his desired Christmas gift. But Christmas came and there was no gift. And the mother said, maybe grandma forgot. Say, no, no, no. Grandma will never forget. And the mother then suggested to the son and said, why don't you write to grandma? Then he said, okay, I will write. And I'm going to write to thank her. And so the letter went to grandmother. And the grandmother returned in response, in reply. My dear George, I have not forgotten my promise to you for a stamp album. I could not find the one you wanted here. So I ordered one from New York. It did not arrive until after Christmas. And it was not the right one. I then ordered another, but it still has not arrived. So I've decided to send you that $30 instead so that you may buy the one that you want in Chicago, your loving grandma. And as this grandson read the letter, his face lit up from the depth of a heart that never doubted came the words, Now, mom, didn't I tell you so? Do we say this of God? God says so. He will do it. When God said he will do something, he will do it. God said it. When God gave the Abrahamic covenant that he will bless the people and make Israel a nation, and from that nation to make that nation a blessing, God will do it, and he did. Today, when God said to the church and said that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, but that the gospel will go forth from the church to the ends of the world, he will do it. It's just for us to obey. He will do it. You know, we see a lot of things in part, but God sees in full. But the question this afternoon is, do you have the faith to believe? In Streams of the Desert, I was doing my devotion, and I thought this passage reads... 
and reflects what is said this afternoon. Streams in the desert. So this person wrote this. True faith relies on God and believes before seeing. We want evidence, but we need no evidence other than God's word. He has spoken in harmony with our faith. It will be done. We will see because we have believed. Faith that believes it will see will keep us from becoming discouraged. We will laugh at seemingly impossible situations while we watch and delight to see how God is going to open the path through the Red Sea. It is in these places of severe testing, with no human way out of our difficulty, that our faith grows and is strengthened. Because you believe, you will see. The world says we see, therefore we believe. But for us, it's we believe and therefore we will see. I, I think some of you may know this hymn. This hymn is a very old hymn, so maybe those who are older Christians will know this hymn. How many of you know this song, His Eye is on the Sparrow? I see two young persons hand. Raise high. Let me see. Three, four. We're all young. Eh? <laughs> the older <laughs> five. Okay. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Yeah, this is, a, this is a song that I, I sing quite a bit when I was younger. Remember I said that I'm easily discouraged, right? So I love this song for the first line. You say, why should I feel discouraged? I, why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. So I love this first stanza because it speaks my heart. But then the chorus is very different. The chorus go like this. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. I say, God, I cannot sing this. I cannot sing this. I can sing the first stanza. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? But when I'm discouraged, I cannot sing because I'm free, I'm happy, I'm not. And then usually I will skip the chorus. And then I go to second stanza. Let not your heart be troubled, his tender word I hear. And resting on his goodness, I lose my doubts and fears. Though by the path he leaders, but one step I may see. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. And the chorus is supposed to reflect the fact that God watches, you know, us, just like his eye is on the sparrow. Therefore, I can sing and be happy, but at that time, I really could not. So for many years, I, I, I find it very hard to sing the chorus. But as I grow older, I begin to understand, you know, that sometimes, you know, we don't see everything. And therefore, we find that we cannot praise God. You see, the intent of writing to King Darius was to get him to stop the work. But instead, he worked to the advantage of the Jews. What an irony. Just like the song, the last song that the song leader, worship leader was leading us. God will even, whatever the enemy intends for evil, God in, will turn it around for the good of his people and for his glory. And that's what God did. When the letter was sent to King Darius to get him to stop the work, instead it turned out to be that he endorses the work. So we can praise God even when things are difficult. Not because of the present, but because we anticipate the future. That God will still have his last word. So now I understood the songwriter. At that time, I could not sing the chorus because I see in part. But now I can sing the chorus because I see not in part, 
but in full. So my brothers and sisters, as you go into the near future of uncertainty and challenges, let nothing deter you or discourage you. Instead, believe and continue to build and move forward. Look beyond the present. God will fulfill his purpose concerning you. So as we pause and think about this, what has God laid upon you as a church? What has God laid upon you as a church? What is the future of X Baptist Church going to look like? I'm quite sure it's not going to be without challenges. But can you trust God and take that step of faith? And whatever challenges, don't turn to I, turn to God. And He will open the way. It is not about you, it's always about God. But the important thing is that we prepare for the future by taking care of the present. So I would like us to bow our heads. As we bow our heads, I want to give you something, a few questions to reflect on. Collectively, we are the church. Have you stopped building or have you stopped rebuilding because there are various oppositions in your life? What has come to a standstill in your life with God? How long has that been? For the church to be healthy, as an individual, you need to be healthy. Will you return to God's word? Will you spend time every day with God's word? Will you take time every day to pray to God? That is the most basic and most important aspect of our walk with God. And when God gave his word, stand on his promises. Obey and rest in the knowledge that God watches over you. Do what is right in the eyes of God. Duty belongs to us. Events belong to God. Present belongs to us. The future belongs to God. So I want to just give you a moment to respond to God. If you are to be ready for the Lord's work in the future, you need to be ready in your life with him right now so that God can use you. If you have not been doing your quiet time, may I encourage you, do it not just for your sake, for your own self. Do it because you know you are a part of a church that God is ready to move you into mission with him. Will you take a moment to respond to God? One of the strategic purpose of the church or goals of the church is to have prayer intercessors. But you need to have a life of prayer yourself. Will you give time for prayer? Another strategic priority that I noticed that has been set was that every member become a witness for Jesus Christ. Will you be able to do that? But if you walk close with him, you will have many stories to tell your friends. And God will also be able to use you because your heart is already ready. So will you say a prayer to the Lord and say, God, keep me close to you so that I can be the vessel fit for your use. That together with my brothers and sisters as a community, we can move forward at such pivotal times that will determine the landscape of the nations and of the peoples. Father, we want to thank you that through history, you're always at work. That Lord, it's only when we look back that we understood. And so Lord, today we pray that in all that is happening, believing that you are the sovereign Lord, Father, we know that you're also preparing the world and all that is happening as your world stage for your final redemption. Help us, dear Lord, to be faithful. Help us, dear Lord, to walk close to you. 
Help us not only, Lord, have eyes that see what is happening, but give us eyes that understand that we may learn how to see things through your heart and through the eyes of our Lord Jesus Christ. And help each one of us to walk close to you so that as a church, we can move forward and move beyond the present into the future where, Lord, you have prepared your purposes for us. So, Lord, may you hear our prayers. All this we ask and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.